This is really nice that you guys all took some time off and uh, came in for this. Uh, my name is Roger Mittag. I have a company called Thirst for Knowledge. I want to tell you a little bit about how um, I came here today. And then uh, I'll tell you a little bit of my background and then we'll go into some information about ingredients and brewing and how it relays to your beers. Um, but uh, it was, it was kind of neat. I helped to run the Ontario Brewing Awards and I'm always looking for new brewers to come in. And um, a friend of mine had given me some public and house beer last year. He came up to my cottage, which is just down the road a little bit. And, uh, and I thought the beer was great at that time. And then uh, Ontario Brewing Awards came around and I don't personally solicit any one of the brewers. So I just wait for the, the stuff to come in. And I was really happy to see the public and house had entered in this year. And, um, and then we conducted the awards and then at the end of one night I sort of looked at everything to see who, who won what and, um, and I was really happy to see that, that you won for house ale um, in, in the gold category, in the Lagerdale category. So that was the first thing that I was really pleased about. The second thing is I also tally all the new uh, breweries that come in to find out who had the ultimate highest score because they get an award called Newcomer of the Year. And so I'm tallying all the scores up and I'm pulling them all out and lo and behold, um, House Ale gets highest award, so it gets Newcomer of the Year and I thought this is going to be great. I don't know if I said anything to you guys at that time as to whether or not you should show up to the, to the, uh, no I, I did but you know Jen from Beerlicious, her and I were talking, I said you want to make sure that some people make, they know that they need to be here. Because sometimes you don't know whether you're coming, you're just coming for the first time, and it was first time for you guys, right? So um, I was really happy to actually see you guys get the award because you're close to where I am, you're close to where my cottage is, um, and it's kind of fun. It's nice to see new breweries come up and do a really good job of brewing beer. And, and to me, um, that's the key thing that I love about the beer industry is I'm seeing lots of new life and new breath come into the industry, and it's bringing new styles in. The only thing that I really want to ensure is that you're making good quality consistent beer and not everybody does that. So I want to go through some of the ingredients with you today. Um, I'll give you a bit of my background. I started in 1997 in a company called the Olin Specialty Beer Company and it was unbeknownst to me when I applied for the job was a specialty division of Labatt or Interbrew and it was bringing all the Belgian beers into the marketplace, Stella, Leff, Hugarden, everything. So we got an immense amount of training. They actually took us over to Belgium for a week, um, took us through all the breweries, taught us about the history, how important that was, how to pair beer up with food, how to understand all the nuances, how to talk about it, how to romance it, like everything. And then the expectation was as sales reps that we were gonna come back here and do the same thing with our accounts. And Peterborough was my territory. So I live in Curtis, which is sort of second home to most people from Peterborough because all the teachers that come from here come and teach in schools where I, where I live. Um, so it, it was a lot of fun for me to come here and start dealing with some of the bars and restaurants and I used to do with these guys right next door for a while and so it was, that was a really good part of it. And then I was in sales for four years and then they moved me laterally into the head office at Labatt as a national sales training manager. So my job now was to create beer schools and training programs that were for all of our sales reps and also for everybody within the company. So I had a vast amount of resources at my fingertips, all the brewers from around the world, all the breweries from around the world that I could call up anytime and ask questions. So after a few years, what happened was uh, Interbrew merged with Ambev and Ambev is a Brazilian brewer and they're a very large Brazilian brewer and the deal was for them to um, to actually come up and manage the Canadian business and and I got the impression that in learning and development I was more of an expense than I was a revenue generator and I knew that my days were probably going to be numbered at Labatt so I started making some effort to create my own company so I left in 2005 and started Thirst for Knowledge and felt that there was a need for beer education and right across the country and I also knew I had a feeling that big brewers probably weren't going to employ people to do what I do so that meant that I was creating a little bit of a job for myself 
And uh, so that it's, it's, been, it's been a good eight years. It's been a nice steady growth. In 2009, I started a certification program or an education program called Prudhomme. And I named it after Louis Prudhomme, who was Canada's first licensed brewer in 1650. And so what it is, is a multi-level. It's three different levels of education. And they're all based on sort of wine sommelier kind of programs. So it starts at a beginner level, which is my level one, and then it moves up a little bit more into a little bit more depth, a little bit more information, a little bit more tasting into level two. And then I've got a beer sommelier program, which is the level three program. And that is a lot more in depth. And it's more about teaching and talking about beer. And that sort of brings me to you guys. Um, so today, um, we're going to spend probably an hour and a half together. We've got some pizza coming. We're going to try uh, the two beers. We're going to try House Ale and Square Nail. Um, and we're going to walk through it from a tasting perspective, how I look at it. And I'm going to tell you some things about the characteristics of your beers that are going to be really important for you to be able to talk to other people and understand how some of the subtle characteristics that you might take for granted are actually really good selling features and good selling points. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the ingredients so that you understand what malt tastes like, what hops smell like, because I don't really want you to taste the hops. You guys have? <laughs> That's all you ever need. <laughs> it's all you ever need with hops. Um, but I want you to be really comfortable and ask me any question that you want about beer. And it's not off topic. You can ask me anything you want. You can talk to me about draft. I have quite a bit of expertise in draft. Um, Anything that you guys think that you might actually come up. Um, I know that some of you might be working with um, South Pond Farms, like doing some stuff with them. I'm working a little bit with them in the background on a couple of events. So um, Danielle, is, I met her on a vacation, which is kind of weird. You go away and then you meet somebody who's not very far away from you and then she has some interest in beer, which is kind of cool. So do you guys have any questions right off the bat? This is going to be different training for you, though. Nothing yet? Okay. So how's beer made? What are, what are the four ingredients in beer? Water, yes. Definitely water. We need water. That's the most prevalent ingredient. You guys don't get the answer. <laughs> Got the brewers Barley. over here. Barley, sort of. Yeast? Uh, yeast, definitely, because that's what creates alcohol, and we need that. Um, barley, sort of. I, and I'll get into that in a second. What's the, the fourth one that you guys will use? Hops, yeah. We need hops. And all those ingredients play a really, really key role. Now, the first one I'll start with is barley, because I don't have any samples of water. And using Peterborough water, yeah. city water, and hard or soft? Do you know? Hard. Okay. So a little harder, right? Probably not as hard as, as some, but that, I'll talk a little bit about that and how that's really important for the styles of beer that you're making. Um, but we, we want to use grain. Beer goes back from a historical perspective to well over 10,000 years. And um, it's always been brewed with grains. And one of the good things about using barley, because we do use barley in, in a way, is that it's most similar to the grains, the ancient grains. So um, the kind of grains that were used eight to 10,000 years ago is very similar to what barley is today. And it's got some great characteristics. So it's, it's got an easy source of sugar for us. It's got this really cool husk that acts as a filter bed. And it's an easy conversion into color as well. So we can create some really cool color with it. But the thing with barley, and this is the reason why we can't just use barley, is because it's cellulose and we need sugar. And barley in its pure state can't give us what the brewer wants. And the brewer wants a really nice source of starch or sugar that they can convert into alcohol. So the thing that you have to do to barley is you have to do something called malting. And malting is a process of starting germination or growth and then abruptly halting it. So that's really the simple thing that you do. So you take a raw grain, you soak it in water for about three to four days, then you allow it to grow. These little roots start growing on the inside and what's happening is it's converting cellulose on the inside into soluble starch. And then these guys over here are gonna take that soluble starch and they're gonna turn it into sugar. And that, I'll talk about that in the brewing process. So that happens for another three to four days. And then the last thing that happens is kilning or roasting. And that's where you're going to abruptly stop germination and change color and flavor. So the thing that malt brings to beer is color and flavor for the most part and an easy source of sugar to create alcohol. And that's, that's one of the ways that you can look at it. So we can use pretty much any grain. You guys are gonna, you're about to 
start uh, packaging some wheat beers very shortly, but wheat is a different kind of grain than barley is, and it has different properties, some good, some bad, um, and you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'll show you some wheat samples when we, when we get into it in a sec. So I brought some samples of uh, grains with me, and what I, what I will encourage you to do is to open them up, um, to smell them, taste them, if you haven't already, um, the grains that you're using are Weirman grains, and they're, they're all Weirman? Most. Okay. And who? Okay. So most of the grains are specialty malts that are coming from Germany, and Weirman is one of the best renowned malting companies in the world. They're, they're very, very old. They really do understand what they do best, and they malt grains best. And uh, so the malts that I have are Canadian malts, so there might be some small differences to it, but um, you know, it's really important for you to start getting your vocabulary about what these things smell like to you and what they taste like to you. So take a little bit, smell it, pour a little bit out into your hands. Um, what it may smell like initially, if you grew up, I, sh I say this in jest, but if you grew up in a rural area, um, you might understand what what feed smells like, and it smells a lot like oats that you might give to a horse. It's got that same kind of smell. It smells bready, cereal. Um, it tastes like granola, sunflower seeds, um, bread, bread crust. It's got some really cool flavors to it, and when you crunch through it, you can actually get to the sweetness. Um, this is the primary base malt that almost every beer has, whether it's a really light-colored um, light beer that's very, very pale in color, or to whether it's it's a dark beer. This is the easiest source of sugar. It's got the most natural sugars in it or most natural starches in it that can be converted into sugar and it's going to give you that really nice golden color. So the primary malt, and I, I would estimate it's the same for you guys, like how big is this in your malt bill? But the majority of your malt bill? Okay. So this is the one that you got to get used to, and this is the one that almost everybody else uses. Now this is a two-row malt. This is a prairie two-row malt. Canada is the second um, largest country that produces malt in the world. France produces the most, and then Canada, and most of our malt gets exported. So one malting plant in Calgary produces enough malt for the entire brewing industry in Canada, and then there's several other malting companies around. So what do you guys think? Tastes nice, right? Do they? Yeah. Just as a snack? Yeah, it's it's a fun thing. I mean, when I when I do this and I and I teach a lot, I leave these out, and every once in a while you see people just go back in and start helping themselves. And something that I do if I'm you know if I'm doing an event, I will sometimes sample them all because I really like the taste of it. And over time, I mean, if you work in the brewing industry long enough, you really come to love the ingredients and uh, just the smells and you know when they're malting in the back because you can smell this really nice sweet bready aroma that's coming out it almost smells like they're baking um, the next one i want you to look at is uh, is called a caramel 120 and um, these malts here the pale malts are roasted at around 65 degrees celsius these ones here are going to go upward to over 100 degrees Celsius, but it's a, it's a slightly different way of doing it. And caramelization of malts is the same as caramelizing sugar. So the higher the heat and the longer the time, the more you're going to caramelize and the sweeter you're going to get. The interesting thing about these caramel malts is um, these are the ones that I'm growing really, really fond of these days because these are the ones that add a lot of complexity into beer. And when your beer has several layers of flavor profile, then it's a lot easier to understand what the brewer was trying to do. So try these again um, and start looking for dark fruit flavors and notes in here because not only are you going to get caramel and some burnt characteristics and some chocolate, but you may also get some raisins and some dates and some figs out of this as well. And this is what you start looking for in the darker beers. Um, and this is another reason that I really love talking about beers because even though I like wine as well. I like wine, I should say I like wine, but I prefer beer. Um, wine is a relatively simple beverage. It's made with grapes. And it, you know, as much as wine people would love to tell you that it's really, really sophisticated and complicated, any brewer will tell you that they're wrong. <laughs> 
and that beer has far more complicated and complex na uh, characteristics to it. You just have to learn how to find them. A lot of people just think beer is relatively simple and it's beer is beer. But once you start educating people and telling them that these beers are all slightly different, they have different flavor profiles and they can go with different foods, they start really understanding that you know, the brewer is really a chef. They're, they're taking a bunch of different ingredients, at least four different ingredients, in some cases five, six, seven, eight, and they're blending them all together to create something that they think is going to be thirst quenching and nice and has some great flavors to it. What do you think of this one? This one's a bit more intense, right? Prefer one over the other? First one better, okay. I find a lot of people love this one because it's got, it's got some really nice, robust characteristics to it. The third one I'm gonna pass you is probably not gonna be too many people's favorite. Um, and it's, what I brought for you is a, a dark chocolate malt. And these are roasted, you know, somewhere around 300 to 350 degrees Celsius. So basically, at that heat, I'm getting this close to torching it. So it's about to jump into fire, which means it doesn't have any sugar left in it. So the reason that you're using black malts is really for color and for some intense flavor characteristics. So when your stout was produced earlier this year and you get that really nice chocolatey and coffee kind of characteristic to it, that's where it's coming from. It's coming from these nice dark malts that give it really nice dark color, almost reddish in color in many, in many cases. This one's not gonna have any sweetness. It's gonna be really dry, bitter. Um, it's gonna taste like burnt toast, chocolate, coffee. It's like you bit into an espresso bean, which is a good reason to have water with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? We should like chocolate covered them. There's <laughs> a thought. <laughs> Put them into brownies. Malt brownies. Yeah, that one's pretty intense. So these are just three examples of, um, of what you might find. And you know, you've got tons of different bags out the back. And so there's all kinds of different ingredients. How many different malts do you guys use in house sale, for example? Three, three malts uh, square? Two. OK. So one of the things I hope that you can get out of this is, you know, a lot of times we talk about hops um, being used for bitterness. Um, but the other thing that you can really notice is that uh, malt can create bitterness as well, really depending on what you want. So it's really difficult sometimes when you're dealing with a stout to assess where that bitterness is coming from. A lot of people would love to say, okay, all the bitterness is coming from the hops and the stout, but I'm going to be one that's going to argue and say, I bet a whole bunch of the bitterness is coming from that malt. And, uh, and that's a good thing, is it's not necessary to always find out where the bitterness is coming from. It's more important just to say this has got this much bitterness or that much bitterness. So let me show you some, um, some wheat. And then we'll talk a little bit about what makes wheat a little different grain uh, than, than using for barley. First of all, don't eat this. Because this is raw, unmalted wheat. And um, unless you want to go see your dentist, then you don't want to, you don't want to eat this. Um, but the big thing that you'll notice on it is that it doesn't have a husk. So it has no outer covering. So it makes it a lot more difficult for the brewers to use because now I need to have a filtration bed. So a lot of times when brewers are using wheat, they'll also use some barley in there as well. And the barley really helps to create the filtration bed. But the other big issue with, with wheat is that it's got a lot of protein in it, a lot of gluten. And what will happen inside the brew house is if you're using a high quantity of wheat, it gets really sticky and really gummy. And it makes their job a little bit more difficult because they got to clean it. They got to spend more time cleaning it. The good thing about wheat is that it increases body and foam stability. So the foam that you get at the top of a beer is related to the amount of malt that's in the beer and the amount of protein that's in the beer. So head is basically protein on the beer. So 
when you're pouring your beer in and you get lots of foam on the top, you can tell that it's either 100% malt or it's got some wheat in it. And so you get that really nice foam density and the foam thickness on the top of beers. So there's some really good stuff about using wheat, but a lot of brewers are sort of hesitant. Now, the interesting thing is that wheat beers over the last five years or so, maybe even 10, have become a lot more interesting to the general public, mostly because they're viewed as summer beers and as thirst quenchers. Um, a lot of times they're um, brewed with orange and coriander in a Belgian style, and that makes it extremely thirst quenching and easy to drink. Belgian style? The wheat that which is just a little lighter, not so much in the spicy. Okay. Like Still some citrus, citrus, citrus or okay. What about our hater That's a no. Not a wheat. Yeah, that's. But you know, wheat's wheat's an interesting ingredient. So I just I thought I'd bring all four of those things so that you could you could sort of see the difference behind them, Dave. Well, it, that's kind of an interesting thing. Genetically modified organisms exist in some grains. Um, I think the good thing about barley is that there isn't any in it. And most of the barley that is being used in brewing is genetically modified free. Um, I think with wheat, it would depend. I, I think, again, there's not a lot of GMOs. Wheat is more modified than, than probably any other grain. Um, brewers that use corn and rice, which are adjuncts, and they lighten the body of the beer, corn is obviously genetically modified, and so you have to take those kind of things into consideration. But, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. It's a good question. It is, it is a good question because we do get that. Yeah, yeah. well, you, you get a lot of things. I mean, the, the, the good thing for you guys is that, you know, the local movement is strong, and the best beer is always the freshest and the closest beer. So imported beers even though there are some wonderful ones out in the marketplace, are on a ship for six weeks, whereas you know, the beer that comes out of this brew house is in market within days. And um, you know, that, I think that's one of the really key things around. And you know, how you define local is really up to you. I define local in very broad senses that it's Canadian. Um, more local, the closer to me, obviously. But um, a lot of people are very concerned about you know, GMOs. And there's a lot of articles out on the internet these days that talk about all the negative things that are in beer and most brewers, 90% of all brewers in the world really don't do anything negatively to their beers. The fact that there are some things that are allowed in, in brewing of beer as cleaning agents or as filtration agents really don't, yeah, it gets, it gets way more technical. So you have to sort of believe a little bit of what some people tell you and a lot of, Just something that you could, you could say, you know, yeah, you yeah, well, yeah, and, and barley is, Predominantly, and it was one of the reasons. You know, a few years ago, Carlsberg moved away from having corn in their beer to being 100% barley, and it was because the European Union was demanding genetically modified organisms not be within the beers, and malting companies can can guarantee that, and a lot of other grain producers can't, and so that that's a real good thing. Um, I brought some hops with me, and hops are really kind of an interesting ingredient. Um, they are related to cannabis, and they look, it looks like weed. Yes, it does. It, it, in fact, not, no, you could tell by pictures though, right? Yeah. Um, so I always like to start off with that because it's a good talking point, regardless of whether you imbibe or not. Um, but that's okay. They know what it looks like. And I'm not suggesting that it's okay to... <laughs> No, there's, yeah, don't try smoking hops because there is nothing in it that will help you. There's, there's no THC in it, so it's not really of any use. Um, it has lots of benefits, though. So um, let, me, let me give you some of the benefits before I pass these things out. So um, hops were, have been used in beer for thousands of years. There's evidence that they were delivered to the Vine Stefan Monastery in 700 AD. In 1158, a nun in a Bavarian brewery, actually, or a Bavarian abbey, discovered that hops were a natural preservative because she, when she was adding more hops to a lot of different liquids, it just lasted longer. It stopped it from decaying or going bad. So it was from that point on that basically hops became entrenched in the brewing of beer because they were viewed to keep beer for a lot longer. They have a lot of other things in them that are really good. So they have humulones in them, and humulones are antioxidants. 
And antioxidants help offset aging diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart, and stroke, which is why you hear people say that beer in moderation is actually quite good for you. And it is, it's true. So that moderation is two to three a day for men and one to two a day for women, according to scientific studies. So you can take that home and tell people. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I don't really get my students asking that question. No, you, you, can't, you can't build it up and, and on Saturday you have 21. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, the other good thing, interesting thing about hops is that um, from an herbal perspective, they're a galactagogue, which helps with the secretion of milk for breastfeeding mothers. So if, if mothers have just given birth, Moderate amount of beer and hops actually help to bring in milk, which is really kind of a neat thing. Um, so plant that grows anywhere from six feet to 20 feet in one season. And they grow right across the 49th parallel. Um, they're basically a weed. They're very, very deep root system. So if you decide that you want to plant them, make sure that you tell the other gardener in your family that you're doing it because nothing else will live in that garden. Um, these ones were grown locally about five minutes away from my house, or two minutes away from my house, by a guy that I met a few years ago, and he grows hops and phones me up in September and tells me I can come pick some. So these are actually in really good shape. I picked them last year. You can take them out, smell them. These are Cascade hops, so you guys actually use some Cascades. Cascade is a very, very dominant hop variety based in um, Washington, so in the Yakima Valley in Washington. It has this wonderful grapefruit citrus smell to it. Not the flesh of grapefruit, but more the skin of a pink grapefruit. And it's got this, this really nice characteristic. And a lot of American pale ales are using this. And it's, it's that one characteristic that you see. Um, now, where malt brings uh, flavor and color into beer, hops are pre predominantly known for bringing aroma and bitterness. And uh, with that preservative quality in there as well. Hops are also a natural sedative. So the more hops that you put into your beer, the sleepier your consumer will get. Or it's the alcohol. It is a little bit of both. Do we use hops in the house here? Yeah. Yeah, there, this actually cascade is only uh, square. Square, yeah. But you, there's very, very few beers in Canada or globally that don't use hops. Hops are one of those ingredients that almost everybody uses. Some people um, are using things that they call hop turnitives, which add bittering components to it. But they, pardon me? Oh, Gruidales, yeah. Um, but they really don't have the same kind of aromatics. And a lot of things that we look for from beers these days are the aromatics that are derived from the hops. You had a question? Yeah, so this is a primary preservative for beer? Yep. Uh, not, there's one beer that I know that has a preservative in it, and it's sodium metabisulfite, which is a preservative. But the great thing is that that's one of those myths that people believe that big beer companies put preservatives in their beer. They don't. Natural preservatives in beer are hops, alcohol, and carbon dioxide. And, you know, they do other things. They use corn and rice to make their beers lighter, but they typically don't use preservatives, whereas wines are all preservative laden. You've got sulfites in wines where you don't have that in beer, and that's one of the things that, you know, a lot of people will be allergic to sulfites and you get headaches from them. The great thing about beer is that doesn't happen. The only reason you get a headache is probably from overconsumption. <laughs> Maybe a bit of carbon dioxide absorption too, because CO2 does some bad things to your body, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, so those are local ones. Um, these are Chinook leaf hops. Um, this is actually um, more of a bittering hop, so it has an alpha acid rating of 14.6%, which is significantly greater than that one. Um, so you would use this to impart a little bit more bittering. So this would be a good opportunity for me. Um, these have been picked, compressed, and dried. So you can take these out and look at them if you want. There's You'll get them all over the place. Um, and you can understand really quickly why I don't ever travel with these in my, in my luggage. <laughs> they go into my luggage, not my carry-on. So one time I was going through the airport and I had them in my carry-on because I was going through Porter. And um, I spent about 15 minutes explaining why I had these things in my luggage. 
And so now they go into my check luggage so that people don't say, what is this? Looks like some kind of contraband. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're just hops. <laughs> um, and I brought two other kinds. So th these are leaf hops. Um, a lot of brewers are starting to use, smaller brewers are starting to use these again. Big brewers typically don't use flowered hops anymore. Um, they come in very, very large bales, 200 pound bales, and they need to be used right away because they're, they're fresh. And if you open them up, um, they're gonna deteriorate very quickly. So some brewers are using them because they believe that they have a much fresher um, aromatic to them. Um, most brewers use pelletized hops, which is what I'm gonna show you in a second. These, the benefit of using these is that they last, they can last up to two years in vacuum seal containers refrigerated. And so what this, what this means for the brewer is that you get quality and consistency over a two year period. So you know that you're using the same hops day in, day out. You know that your beer should be tasting the same because ultimately you don't want fluctuations in your beer in, in the brewing. That's the sign of a really, really good quality brewer is consistency throughout. And that's how we in the beer industry get rewarded. Wine industry gets rewarded on varietals. We had a good year this year, so we're gonna jack the price up. You try that with beer, that doesn't work. Right? had a really good batch. I'm going to charge a little bit more for it today. Um, so I brought two different kinds of hops here, and I, and I want you to notice the smell difference between those ones, which are U.S. hops, which have a very citrusy smell to them, and these ones. So I brought a German hop called Herzbrucker, and it comes from the Hallertau region. Um, German hops typically are grassy, straw, fresh cut hay, a uh, little bit of green tea in there as well and a little bit of herbal notes. Um, these ones you may not want to get too close to your nose because they're really strong and they're very fresh. Um, and then the other one I brought is an East Kent Goldings hop, which is a UK hop. And UK hops are a little earthier. And so a lot of times what brewers do when they're creating styles is they pick the hop to be reflective of the style. So the malts don't necessarily matter a whole lot, but what does matter is the hop. So if you're making a British pale ale, for example, you might want to use British hopping because you want that aromatic characteristic. If you're making an American pale ale, then citrus cascade hops are a really good way of, of going forward. Doing a good job just putting everything back for me. I'm like an organized person. You guys have any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Is it, Brian, is it the so that's all very interesting. So when we taste the saws, um, there's, or when we taste the house sale, we're going to look for some of the hop characteristic in there. Now the interesting thing is the award that you guys won is for the house sale, which is a lager ale. So lager ales typically, um, what you do is you, you ferment ales normally at warmer temperatures and lagers at colder temperatures. So when you're fermenting at colder temperatures and you're using ale yeast, what you're doing is you're subduing it a little bit. So you're subduing the fruity notes that you would normally get out of an ale and you're creating more of a lager kind of characteristic to it. So what you're getting is a little bit more body, but you're still getting that thirst quenching characteristic out of the house ale. So using German hops and Czech hops is a really good way of going because that's exactly, hopefully that's exactly what you guys were planning on to begin with. I'm just saying that. Yeah, that or, or you found some stuff and threw it in. Let's, let's see what this looks like. <laughs> yeah, okay, so Kolsch. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring the word Kolsch up in a table beer. Kolsches are uh, a very, very specific geographical appellation that has to be applied only in the city of Cologne. And uh, they banded together in the 1400s. And they, the reason that they were, they were doing this is trying to protect the brewers from outside influences. And in the 1800s, they became very, very dominant because Pilsners were starting to become very strong. So they created these golden colored beers that they called Kolsches. And so outside of Cologne, you have to pick a different name for your beer. You can't call it a Kolsch. And uh, there was a brewer in Ontario that was calling it a Kolsch for a while, and they stopped and by uh, Bose. Yeah. And they don't call it a Kolsch anymore because I'm certain that somebody came a knocking on the door and said, I don't think so. It's like champagne and scotch, 
Exactly. Yeah. And there's not very many in, um, in beer, but Kolsch is one of those ones that's really protected. So if the idea was to create sort of a German Kolsch, then using Tetanang and Pearl and Saz hops is exactly what you want to do. And so that's perfect. And therefore you won. <laughs> but that's really how it, that's really how it should go. Um, so water is really important because it's the biggest ingredient. And for brewers, that was, they always set their brewery up around a good quality water source because you could transport malt and hops and yeast was just in the air that you breathed, so you didn't really have to worry about it. But you always wanted to set around a good quality water source. Now the interesting thing about the kind of water that you use affects the type of beer that you're going to make. So the water in the southern part of Europe or in, in Bavaria and the Czech Republic is extremely soft, which is mineral free. So what that's going to do for your beer is it's going to create an extended mouthfeel. So you're going to get a very soft texture in there, but it's going to just hang around for a while. And it's got lots of flavor. When you're using hard water, what calcium and magnesium do to beer is one, they enhance yeast production. So they actually work well in fermentation. But the other thing is minerality creates an edge to the beer. So it creates more thirst quenching characteristics and a crisper, cleaner finish. So having city of Peterborough water that's you know, relatively hard. I'm going to say relatively hard because it's not as hard as other waters, but that actually helps from a brewing perspective because it creates the kind of beers that you're trying to make. And yeah, and so you you burtonize, right? So burtonization. Um, do you? Okay. So what we're talking about, calcium chloride and, and gypsum, is called Burtonization. And that term came from Burton-upon-Trent, which is renowned as having the hardest quality water and was great for making pale ales. So that whole, that whole mineral content that was in Burton, a lot of brewers really envied that and they wanted to replicate it. So a lot of brewers do that right now. Um, even big brewers will do it. They'll remineralize. So they'll take local city water and they'll make it the same from, what brewery, from one brewery to another. So it, it's virtually impossible to say that a, a beer that was brewed in Halifax, for example, or in Toronto or in Vancouver from one brewery is different because I'm going to tell you that water is identical. So the good thing about small breweries is that what they can do is they can play with it and they can make the water exactly the way that they want it for the yeast that they have so that it's going to react well and for the recipe that they're making. So water is a very, very important ingredient as well. And harder water means more thirst quenching and easier to drink. And again, those are, these are sort of selling features that you can use when you're talking to people and talk about, you know, we've got some really nice good Peterborough water, which has got a little bit of hardness to it. And that's why you're seeing that beer so nice and easy to drink and so thirst quenching and crisp. So proper vocabulary is very, very important when you're trying to entice people to enjoy your beer. Not that they won't on their own, but everybody needs a little bit of help, right? Um, so any, any other questions right now? Because I'm going to talk a little bit about brewing. And then, know, Dave, water, sorry. Is the chlorine level, like I know in summertime, Peterborough adds a lot of chlorine in water. I don't know if it's filtered. You guys filter. We, we filter that. But yeah. after, your yeast won't work. Yeah. Yeah, you want to get chlorine and fluoride and anything else out that you want. You just want to leave the minerals in there. Every brewer will filter. Everybody does it slightly differently. Big brewers use, you guys use UV as well or sterile? Just uh, carbon. 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 Yeah. Carbon filtration is the most standard. Uh, everybody does that. And then some brewers go to different levels. UV takes waterborne bacteria out. Um, in many cases, you don't need to do it because the city's already doing it for you anyway. Um, so it's, it is important to understand what your water is. And, you know, I, I know a new brewer that's opening up in a new place just north of where I live. And um, they draw their water from three different sources. So you can imagine from a brewer's perspective, that'd be a nightmare because now you've got to go and analyze it every time and, and your beers are going to taste different. So you want, you want consistent products all the way through. So... Um, making beer is the, the easy way of looking at it, and I'm going to try to simplify it because I think brewers are scientists and chefs combined into one. And you have to understand both of those things, but to talk to the lay person or anybody that's out there drinking beer, most people really don't get how it's made. And really look at it like making coffee, because it's very similar. You could make beer in a, in a coffee maker. 
So what you have to do is, if you think about it from this perspective, if I took whole coffee beans and I stuck them in a pot of hot water, what would you get? Murky, murky, dark water. It didn't have a whole lot of taste and really wouldn't take that edge off in the morning. So what we need to do is get at all the great stuff. And the way to get at it is you crack it open. So you grind it to get at the caffeine, at the flavor on the inside. So the brewer has to do the same thing with the malt. So you want to crush it and grind it up so that you can open up the starch so that you can have access to it. And then they put hot water in. They don't necessarily want to boil it at this stage. They want to increase the water intensity to a certain temperature. And what's happening now is the hot water is activating enzymes that are within the grain. And the enzymes are now taking the starch and they're converting it into sugar. So now I have this really sugary sweet solution at the end called wort. And wort is an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning root. So this is kind of the root of the beer. This is the start. So at this point, this is called mashing. And mashing is really where we're going to dictate how much alcohol we're going to have at the end what that beer is going to taste like for the most part from a sweetness perspective. Once you're finished mashing, you're now going to filter. And lautering is a German word for filtration or clarifying. And the lauter ton is basically a giant coffee filter. Look at it that way. Now, I'm assuming that you guys are using a mash lauter ton combination, right? And small brewers will always use one vessel to do both things until they get so big that they can, they need to amp up production and then you want two separate vessels. But it's cost effective to use one. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're allowing the water to drop down. So the wort's dropping down through the grains as a filter bed and it's coming out nice and clear at the end. From that clear liquid, so that wort, you're now taking that, putting it into the kettle. The kettle's gonna be anywhere from an hour to two hours depending on what they're trying to achieve. And that's where the flavoring ingredients are gonna go primarily hops. So aroma hops are gonna go in right at the end, maybe even after the boil, but bittering hops are gonna go in right at the front. So as soon as the boil starts, we wanna get the bittering hops in there because hops need to be boiled to extract the bitterness out of them. So you're gonna leave it in for the whole time. You're gonna filter again. You're gonna get any, rid of any of the particulate that's sitting in there, any of the hop particles, any of the malt particles that are still sitting in there. And you got nice, clear wort that's getting ready to go into fermentation. Cool it down because yeast likes some heat, but not a lot. And then we're going to put it into a fermentation vessel. You guys have some brand new ones in here, which is beautiful. And then the yeast gets added in, and then they're going to monitor temperature. So you want a very specific temperature. How long do you guys ferment for? Uh, it's about five days. Five days? That's, that's a pretty hearty yeast. A lot of brewers are, are fermenting at you know, three days. Um, so five days gives you the really nice flavors that you want and then you're going to start cooling it down a little bit in aging? Uh, depending on the beer, it's 7 to 14. 14. 7 to 14 days is long for an ale. Right? And now this comes so for another benefit for you. Standard is about 3 to 4 days. So when you're seeing ales that are being produced at more of a, a larger level, three to four days is fairly standard. The longer you age, the more expensive your beer is, but the smoother it becomes. So all beers need to age, but aging time is what backs up your brewery. You can have a brew house that can produce massive amounts of beer. Everything stops in the fermenting tanks and the aging tanks. And if they don't have enough of them, then you can't produce anymore because it's now sitting in there for 14 days and they want to brew some more. These guys are they like brewing, right? They, they want to get some more out. So the aging and fermenting tanks are the things that hold everything up. And then, so the longer you age your beer, the smoother it becomes, and also the more expensive it is to actually brew. And then you want to put it into bright beer, and then you're going to put it into package. So you're going to put it into cans, bottles, draft, either way, and then you're going to get it out to the consumer, and then we get to enjoy the fruits of your labors. Questions, I went through that really quick. So any other questions that you might have? Or for these guys? Uh, you just want to talk a little bit about what yeast does to the beer? Uh, there's some interesting ways of looking at it. I'll try to look at it from, um, from more of a science perspective. Um, so yeast is a single cell organism. It's about 15 times larger than bacteria. 
And um, what it does, it has always been the active ingredient in brewing a beer, but prior to the 1800s when Pasteur discovered yeast, it was believed that God was responsible for creating alcohol. So as, as good people, we were good, we were good folks, and God shone down upon us and gave us alcohol to drink. Yay. Yeah. But Pasteur wrecked all that and told us it was science behind it. So uh, what yeast does is it thrives on two things. It thrives on uh, a nutrient, which is sugar, and oxygen. And we want pure oxygen in there. We don't just want air because air has bacteria in it. So we need some pure oxygen. So once we put the yeast into that sealed environment where there's pure oxygen and sugar, what it's going to do is it's going to eat as much as it possibly can. So it's like a teenager in your house. So it's just going to keep eating and eating and eating and eating until it can't eat anymore. And then it's going to go a little bit of sleep and it's going to start, this is where it's not like a teenager, it starts to reproduce. <laughs> and um, what's going to happen is more of it's, it's going to foam and it's going to create more yeast and that yeast is going to eat. So the aerobic stage is where it's consuming all the oxygen and the sugar. It's going to consume all the oxygen before it consumes all the sugar. And then it's going to go into a different stage. In the anaerobic stage is where it starts consuming the rest of the sugars. Now that's really beneficial because if these guys have done their job right in mashing, what's going to be left is very, very few complex carbohydrates. Complex sugars can't be digested by yeast and that creates mouthfeel. So when you get beers that have really heavy texture in them, in your mouth, that means there's still some complex sugars that are remaining. So what the brewer is trying to do is create beers that have fermentable sugars so that the yeast can eat everything so that you get a nice dry finish and you have no fermentable sugar so you get this really easy drinking thirst quenching characteristic. So in essence what yeast does is it eats carbon dioxide and oxygen, no it eats, sorry, sugar and oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide, heat and alcohol. You had a question or no? They also use a mash temperature and uh, different types of malt to leave Physically leave unfermentable sugars to create mouthfeel on heavier. Right. Yeah. So again, you know, um, what's your name again? Sorry. Aaron. Aaron. So what Aaron was saying was that sometimes the brewer can can figure it out on his own. If he wants to create more mouthfeel, what they can do is they can control the temperature and the time that it's in the mash, and leave some some complex sugars in there so that you can create that mouthfeel. So the brewer is actually in full control right from start to finish. And so the finished product is really a reflection of how much time and energy they've or thought that they've actually put into the beer itself. Um, so some of the beers you want a little bit more mouthfeel, but typically for a beer like House Ale and even uh, Square, you, you want a little bit of mouthfeel, but not a lot. You want them fairly thirst quenching, I would think, anyway. Right? But when you're getting into a stout, you want a little bit more fermentable sugars, maybe even in, into the wheat beer, and I haven't seen the rest of your... Um, your portfolio over there. So, um, so what stage does the yeast go into? Is that going into the fermenters or into the mash? It goes into fermenting. So what happens is it goes mash, laudering, boiling. Boiling gets cooled down and then it goes into the fermenting tank. Um, the fermenting tanks that are used commonly now are called unitanks and it's where fermenting and aging happens in the same tank. Um, historically they've always, they've always been horizontal tanks that went deep into the brewery and you move them from fermenting to aging. So you, every time you move beer, you have the potential for damaging it. So if you can keep it in one tank, um, what happens is it, it stays relatively solitary. And you can use your yeast over and over and over again. How many times do you guys use it? Three to five. Okay, three to five. Some brewers, their yeasts are really robust and they can get up to 11 cycles through it. But the problem with yeast is you have to monitor it because it's a living organism and it wants to do different things. And if it doesn't, if it's not very robust, it can start changing the way that your beer tastes and smells. So it's really important. That's why I always say, you know, it's sort of a blend between craft and science where you're taking a lot of scientific knowledge and you're blending it into what can be a really nice artful craft. And so you're, you're creating these recipes that, that people will love and enjoy. Yeah, it goes, it goes from aging, so fermenting, then aging. So you got about five days in fermentation, anywhere from seven to 14 days in aging. So just to give you perspective, 
you know, bigger brands are going to be seven days in and out. So seven days to market. But your beers are going anywhere from 12 days to 19 days. So that's a longer period of time. There's a lot of thought and process that goes into that. So it goes fermentation, aging, and then it goes filtering into bright beer and then bright beer into packaging. Did I get that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's always interesting talking when brewers are in the room. <laughs> no, that's wrong. <laughs> cool note on yeast is uh, at the, another brewery I worked at, we got, we just made basically just a house sale. And we got the Belgian yeast actually from, from here that they used in their, in their eight or better. And it just completely changed this whole, just than just this normal beer to this, this spicy, really complex beer. So it's amazing how much the yeast yeah, it's, it, Eric makes a really good point in that is a lot of times what we do is we look at hops and malt as being the two flavoring ingredients in beer. Um, even though water has some characteristics, it creates more mouthfeel than anything else. But a lot of people don't understand the aromatic characteristics of yeasts. And Belgian yeasts are very, very spicy. Um, can sometimes come across like cloves. They can be uh, bubble gummy. German yeasts in German Weiss beers are cloves and bananas. Um, so a lot of times some of the aromatics that you're getting, if you're getting fruity notes out of any of the beers, it's most likely the yeast that's creating that. Um, and, and those, you know, except for square, which you're going to get that citrus. The citrus is really the hops in that case. But for house ale, any of the fruity notes that you'll pick up on that, if you're getting apples and pears, those bright fruit notes, those are yeasts. That are doing that. So it's the more that you, you start to learn about beer, the more you start understanding really how complex it, it, it is and what a great product it can be. Shall we try some? Do, do, you, want, do you want to just comment on because we're, we're doing more of it and more brewers are is uh, leaving yeast in the beer. Ah. So it seems to be a growing, not emerging because it was done hundreds of years ago, right? But so, um, okay, so Marty's question is um, a lot of brewers are not filtering or they're, they're leaving yeast in the beer. And um, there's two trains of thought. I mean, the first one, if we go back to 1842 when Pilsners were created, they started filtering. And so it became the rage to have crystal clear beers that you could see right through. And so there's, there's some benefit because you have less mouthfeel to it. But every time you filter, you filter out flavor. And so a lot of brewers more recently, um, and there's two trains of thought on this. One is you can add yeast back in, which is called re-fermentation. And that has a lot of different benefits to it because it creates more carbon dioxide, um, lengthens the shelf life on the beer. But filtration, the, or the lack of filtration, so now we're starting to see some beers that are hazy. Not necessarily cloudy or, or you know, can't see through it, but hazy. And what's happening is you're getting all the full flavors that the brewer had in, in the tanks to begin with. So it just means that your beers are a little bit more full flavored. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, if you gave somebody a, a hazy beer, it would have come back because they would have thought something's wrong with it. But more beer drinkers now are starting to understand that it's okay for beers to be hazy. The only thing that I would suggest on that is you should know whether your beer is supposed to be hazy or not. And if it's crystal clear beer and it's hazy, then something's wrong with it. So this is, again, one of those things that it's really important to explain to people that um, are, is one of your beers not filtered? Uh, most of our seasonal, seasonals are not filtered now. Okay. So when the seasonals come out and they're not filtered, it's really important to explain that to people so that they don't get the wrong impression. Because if they're used to house ale or they're used to square, then they may be looking for crystal clear and they may be thinking that they're not getting the right beer. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, I don't know what your date coding is, but I'll just give you an example how a consumer can misinterpret something very, very easily. So in Toronto, a consumer went into the Steam Whistle Brewery and bought beer right from the brewery, walked out the door, was out the door maybe two minutes, and came back in and said, this beer is past its date code. So there's a date code stamped on the, on the beer, and they said, no, it, that's not true. This is really fresh beer. And they said, no, no, this, this is the best before date. And they said, no, actually, that's the package day. That's when it went in, and it was yesterday. So you know, the, the fact is that we don't have enough 
standardization from date coding, it's really important to give people as much information as possible. So if you're leaving the yeast in, if you're not filtering, you have to tell people that. We've left the yeast in to give it more body, more flavor. Um, it's not as though anything's, yeah, don't tell them anything isn't wrong with it because then they start thinking, they hear wrong and they start thinking that. So always positive on the positive side of it. Um, but for, for beers like wheat beers that are sometimes re-fermented, so the yeast is added back in, what you do is you increase carbonation, which then reduces the impact of the wheat. So it reduces some of the thickness of that gluten. But then you're getting a little bit more of a refreshing beer as well. There's all kinds of different ways of looking at, at beers and, and trying different things. I mean, one of the things I really like about you guys is that you're doing very standard. Um, you make st true to style beers. Um, which to me is really important because I, I personally have a difficult time when people start making, uh, when they start jumping around in styles and they start creating these style hybrids when they don't know how to make the traditional one first. So I think you got to make the traditional one well and then you start branching out and doing some other stuff. So. Right. Just for some of the staff that are working in the summertime, the, the wheat beer that will be coming out shortly is, as Brian mentioned, is our summer seasonal. It's a non-filtered beer. So if you're at an event or serving on a patio and someone has a house ale and then they ask for the wheat ale, it's exactly what Roger's saying is they'll see that the, there's not the clarity in the beer. And so Roger's explanation is, is how you would address that if somebody said, hey, there's something wrong with my beer. Um, can you take it back? So it, we purposely are doing that, and it, it really gives the vibrancy that we're looking for in the, in the wheat ale as far as uh, giving that taste experience to someone in the summertime. And it's also, I, that's a really good point, but it's also standard and true to style now. So people's expectations of wheat beers are that they're coming cloudy. And so to have one that's not cloudy makes you start wondering why isn't it? Because, you know, all the other competitive product that's out there in the wheat beer category is cloudy. And so you kind of have to play along with that. And so I think a lot of people's expectations now are growing with, with getting a wheat beer so that they'll understand that it's supposed to be cloudy, um, but you're still gonna deal with a whole bunch of uninitiated people. Um, you know, yeah, oh, it happens a lot. I mean, we're dealing with a very, very small community of people that actually know anything about beer. And, um, you know, trying to, trying to help people to understand a little bit more about beer is sometimes a daunting task. Yeah. You mean there's more to Bud Light than this? Well, there is, actually, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little bit. <laughs> All right, um, so let's uh, we'll get some beers, and uh, we'll, we'll take a walk through a couple of the beers, and we'll have a look, and then I think um, you guys have some pizza coming as well, right? Which should be right on. Um, Brian, if we can, you can pass some of those around. Um, we're going to use larger cups. It doesn't mean that we're filling it up. It means that we're going to pour a little bit in, and then we're going to, um, and then I'll walk you through some of the, the way to taste and appreciate beer as well. You're welcome. Thank you. you guys got to get your own. So yeah, pour exactly. Pour exactly that much in, and then I want to walk you through how, how to look at it. Pour it straight in so that you can see what the foam looks like. Do you? See, I always find that. I always find that kind of interesting. People in the wine industry um, have always been taught that they need something to spit their wine into. And I always say that in the beer industry, we swallow our beer because we think more of our product than they do. <laughs> but it's actually to get the bitterness out of it. <laughs> so um, for me, the, the things that you want to look at is you want to always observe beer. So there's steps that you want to go to. And the best thing that you can do is get beer off of a table and up into the light. So if you, if you hold that up, um, I'll send you something as well. Marty, I created a color chart on beer, so it helps people to use the right vocabulary on how to describe beer. I'm not a fan of using yellow as a descriptor, and I think that you can probably figure out why. <laughs> but what I like is golden or light golden or straw colored or, you know, um, you can come up with, with different kind of colors. This has got a really nice golden tinge to it. 
Um, and you can see the other thing that I look at in here is the head color. And the head color is really nice and white and it's very, very dense. So this is already indicating to me that there's a good amount of 100% malt in here. You got lots of protein. So, and it's nice and clear. And that's what you're expecting on this particular beer. When you're smelling beer, you're gonna do it in a couple of different ways. So the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna just stick your nose straight in, only for a few seconds, and see what you can smell. And normally, um, and this is not a slight against what Brian does or what Eric does, but this is not an overly complex beer, and it's not meant to be. There are a few aromas in there, and there are some tastes, but it's, to me, this is meant to be a thirst quencher, and that's why it was so successful at the Ontario Brewing Awards, is it is actually true to style. So what you should be smelling is, you should be smelling a little bit of fruitiness. You might smell some pear, some apple. Um, and then you can start to smell a few other things. There's a bit of grassiness in there. The Saz hops that are used, when do you guys use them as aromatic or bitter? Aromatic. So aromatic characteristics of Saz are a little bit of citrus and a little bit black pepper. So what you should find is a little spicy note in there and then some fresh cut grass or hay. And you, when I talk about fresh cut grass, I'm talking about that sweetness that you smell when you drive by a field when they've just cut it down. Um, with tasting glasses, you have to continue to stick your nose in to see what else you're getting. It's useless to try to do it on one. When you're doing events, you're not going to get a whole bunch of people that are going to be smelling things and they're w wanting their beer cold. The colder beer gets, the less aroma it has. So if you really are trying to analyze the beer, you want this to be considerably warmer than what it is so that you can actually smell it. But this is the temperature that a lot of people are going to drink it at. Or is it, does it feel warmer? To me, that's a good temperature. A lot of people are going to think, that's a bit warm for me. I want it really cold. The other thing you have to think of is the colder it gets, less flavor it's going to have. So good. Pardon me? So good. Yeah, yeah. So when you take a sip, take one sip, hold it on your tongue, and roll it around in your mouth so that it can touch all of your taste buds, and then swallow. And then I want to ask you a few little questions. So one of the things that you want to look at once... <laughs> There's no pressure. <laughs> one of the things you want to look at is impact. And impact is the amount of what the bitterness does as soon as it enters your mouth. So does it hit you really hard or does it sort of come in nice and slowly and just sort of meander through? And for me, this one is not high impact. It's relatively low impact, which is what the design of this style of beer should be. It should be low impact. It should have some bitterness, right? It does. Can everybody agree that it's got a little bit of bitterness? Um, and then the finish on it is relatively quick and clean for me. That means it sort of empties out really in a very short period of time. It doesn't linger a whole lot. Um, one of the things I didn't mention before when we were talking about hops is that there's been this thing in the media for a long period of time talking about bittering units and the intensity of what hops bring to beer. So there was a scale that was created in the 1950s that is called an IBU scale. It's International Bittering Units. And what IBUs do is they measure hop post-fermentation from zero to 100. You can go over the scale if you really want to, but it's virtually useless to do that because your mouth can only detect about 80 IBUs. So your tongue basically shuts down after 80. So going above 80 doesn't make any sense at all. Real thirst quenching beer, so true Kolsch's in this case, are gonna be somewhere between 21 and 27 IBUs. And this one's 26, 23. So that to me is right in the range that most people either really love or it's probably a bit of a stretch. So people are drinking Bud Light. Bud Light is six. No, it's not. It, it's more than one. <laughs> Bud Light's about six to eight. I, I can usually give ranges. Um, you know, when you go against other beers within this category, and competitive brands might be things like Sleem and Cream Ale, about 50 Molson Export. If you're thinking about big brands, and you're going to see people at events and festivals where they're actually going to say, yeah, I drink this beer all the time. And if you know what they drink, then you can easily say, well, try this one because it's very similar. It's got a little bit more body to it, but it's very similar. It's very thirst quenching. Power of suggestion is huge, right? Telling people how much they're going to enjoy something, you'd be surprised at how that works, right? 
So usually you encourage people to take a second, a second sip, and now you're going to get a little bit more flavor. What's like Molson Canyon and Moosehead and all that kind of stuff? Ideas? Yeah, ideas. Uh, about 12. Yeah, Blue's about 12. Canadian would be around 12 to 14. Keese is about 14. Uh, Sleeming Cream Ale is around 17. Um, a lot of the German Pilsners, Kolsch's are um, 20 and up. Um, usually 20 to about 27. When you start getting up a little bit more there, you start adding a little bit more intensity. So I still think anywhere below 40 to 45 is still really thirst quenching and easy to drink. Um, there's a term that's being used a lot in, in the business these days called sessionability or session beers. Session beers are beers that you go out and you can drink over a long period of time with a bunch of friends. Not necessarily to become inebriated, but just as social, you know, lubricants, if you, if you will. Like, so you just, you're just you sitting around in the backyard or you're sitting and talking around people and it's a nice hot day. You want a beer that's not going to fill you up or fill you up in your mouth. And the higher the IB is, the more filled up you're going to get in your mouth. You may not get full in your stomach, but you're not going to want any more. And then you're going to switch to something that's a little lighter, a little sweeter. Um, and so for me, that, that, that IBU range that's in that mid-range, anywhere from 20 up to 40, is sort of the ideal. That's where you want to be. And um, so this is, this is great. Like I, I, I wish I could get it, though, because it's not in my LCBO, Matt. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Twenty. Yeah, twenty. Yeah, you know what? You can you can push things down. I mean, the thing that you have to look at is most consumers want beers that taste very very light. They use them as thirst quenchers. That's the way that most of the industry is, and so um, most small brewers tend to go for flavor and not necessarily for lack of flavor. And so, but there's a fine blend. Um, you know, one of the things I really haven't mentioned that I, that I admire a lot in some brewers is the ability to balance. So a balanced beer is balanced between hops and malt. And there's a real secret to doing that because balance creates drinkability and that creates the, the, ob, you know, the objectivity of having one more. So imbalanced beers don't make me thrive to have another one. A balanced beer makes me want to just stick it in my fridge and have it as my go-to all the time. So if I'm up at the cottage, you know, having a sale up there is just real easy, right? Because it's a nice hot day, you're on the dock, what else could you do? Um, so that kind of works for me. And then let's um, try the square as well. You need a new glass. You're not using the same glass, by the way. Um, use wine glasses if you want to um, sample friends at home. If they don't understand what the beer is going to taste like, just get a nice wine glass, pour it about the same amount in, and make them go through the same steps that we just went through. S you know, look at it, smell it, taste it, see what the aftertaste is like. Here, Eric. I'll take your empties. I was just about to collect them up, actually. Guys have empties? I'll take empties. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I do have empties. Thank you. <laughs> I opened this one a while ago, so. Yeah, I got stopped by right on the way in. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I came off at Ashburnham. There was a whole bunch of police there. And, uh, oh, it was a seatbelt check. Yeah, it was. But they were really nice. I mean, there was about three or four of them. And they basically said, hey, we're just doing, we're just doing a check, seatbelts. Have you had anything to drink today? And I said, no. Didn't really want to tell them where I was coming, though. <laughs> no, but if you stop me on the way out. <laughs> so for the taste notes. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, tasting notes, um, I always go aroma first. So my tasting notes would be that it's, it's fruity, more towards apple and pear. Um, there's a little bit of a malty body to it. So if you think about what malt is, um, in the first one, 
for the house sale. The malt is more bready. Um, with this one, it's going to be more dark bread and crusty bread. So you're going to see that caramel malt come out in this one. So, um, yeah, I can, I mean, I have my tasting notes at home, actually, on these two beers that I was given last year. So they're... Um, so there's a couple of cool things with this one. One is you'll notice that this one is a lot darker. So if you hold it up, um, colors like caramel, burnt orange, amber. Um, you can use fruit colors in there as well, like apricot and peach, because those kind of things sort of resonate with people if you can identify different color ranges. Um, the other interesting thing on here is you'll notice that the foam is a lot different colored. So the foam for me is, is now ivory. And so that just indicates that there's a lot of darker malts in there, and it's really thick. So you can see how nice and thick that is. That is going to last a long time. And if you pour beer with foam properly, what you're going to do is protect the beer all the way down. So we want to encourage people to always pour with foam. And, you know, if you're at an event, never no foam on the top. Foam is going to help protect the beer from oxygen. It's going to bring all the aromas out, and it's going to take some of the CO2 out of the beer and then cap the rest underneath. And I, I'm going to talk about carbon dioxide in a second and how that's important with what you're doing as well. So if you stick your nose in this one, now you're going to get some different flavors. Now you should be getting that Cascade hop in there, that grapefruity nose. There are different aromas. It got wet. There are different aromas at different places in the glass when you're using it. So if you're doing this with wine glasses, explore the edge of the glass and not just down the center because you'll get more intense aromas. You should be getting caramel on this too and a little bit of toffee, some darker bread notes. And then when you take a sip, you'll notice that the impact is a little bit more than on the, on the house. So when you talked earlier about the full mouth impact that you're looking for? Yeah. So between the two, characterize this as having more of that impact? Yeah, it's definitely, it has more impact, but it's still not, this has nice bitterness to it. It doesn't have, it's, it's not sending a message to me that I don't want any more of it. It's sending a message going, okay, there's some good hops in there, there's some good malts in there, but the finish is still really quick. Like it hits me fast and then it empties out. And I like that in a lot of beers because what that makes me want to do is have another one. You, the other thing that you'll notice right now is you'll notice your mouth is really dry. All right? Now dryness is really good for beer drinking because what dryness does is it makes your saliva glands secrete and send a message up to your brain that it needs more moisture. <laughs> yeah, and that's why <laughs> dryness is really, really good to have in, in beers. This has got some nice body to it. I think you were saying earlier, Marty, that it's around 34, Brian? On the 43, 43 IBUs. So 43 IBUs is kind of where I would put the start of India pale ales and the end of American pale ales. And the difference between a British pale ale and an American pale ale is the nose pushing forward. So uh, British pale ales are more malty, and the hops are, take a back seat. Whereas American pale ales, the, ho the hops take the front seat on the nose. You still need some good malt and you need some good balance in there. So you're getting some really interesting things. Now pale ales were described as pale ales in the 1700s because they were paler than brown beers. It was a comparative. It's not golden in color. There are some people that believe pale ales should be this color. I'm a firm believer that this is the right color for this this style of beer. Like that's, that's what I'm looking for. If you tell me you're making a pale ale and it's golden in color, I'm, my mind is already starting to go somewhere else. So I want to see that color and I want to see that foam and I want to see those. This is a really good example of an American pale ale. So it's got a little bit more hop nose on it. It's got some nice bittering finish, but it's not overwhelming. So if I look at it and I say it's got some bitterness, it's usually the thing that comes after that is it's nice, pleasant bitterness. It's not trying to tell me to not to not have any more. What's the difference between India pale ale and American pale ale? Ah, okay. So IPAs, which are Indian pale ales, um, India pale ales were created to travel. And 
they basically, the Burton Brewers were doing a really good job of creating pale ales. So they had the right water that tend to enhance a little bit more of the bitterness. Um, but they wanted to have beer for the colonists down in India. And they weren't drinking. Porters were the beer that, of the day. And the colonists had a little bit more money in their pocket and didn't really want to drink a common man's beer, which a porter was. So they asked for beers to be shipped to India. And the only way that you would get it to India is by creating more hops and more alcohol. So both are which preservatives. So India Pale Ales were named after the East India Trading Company because that was the carrier that took these pale ales down to India. So they were originally called East India Pale Ales. Um, and typically now what you see is an IPA in American standards start, like it's at bare minimum in the 40s and it's usually 60, 70 and 80 and higher these days. I find most IPAs are imbalanced and a lot of people really like big bitterness. I'm not one of them. I like, I love beer and I want to drink lots of it. <coughs> Responsibly, but lots of it. So I'm talking right now to you. <laughs> um, so a British bitter? A British bitter is a pale ale. Okay. British bitter is a misnomer and again is a comparative. They were more bitter than British milds. But a British Pale Ale and a British Bitter are almost, they're identical styles. And, um, and the only thing that the Americans have done is added a little bit more hop character to it, which is giving you a little bit more aromatics and you know, you've still got lots of, um, lots of good flavor. These are great beers to have with, with uh, more full flavored foods and spicy foods. So you think of hops as spice. And so hops used to combat spice. So if you've got a nice curry or something with a little bit more bite to it, this is a great beer to have with it. No, other way around. IPAs are more hoppier than American pale ales. So American pale ales, like this. So if you want to think about a comparative brand to this, um, you would look at Mill Street's Tank House, or those Keith's Hop series, which are significantly lower on the on the BU scale. But those are American pale ales. IPAs take the hops out of the, the park. Um, if you think of it as a, a, like a British pale ale, which is a, the American pale ale is a base on, and then you want to throw it on a boat for four months, so you're just throwing a bunch of hops at it, so it'll last, so it'll last longer. Yeah. That's kind of how it works. So the pale ale is except, here's the big except, this is probably what an IPA would have been in the 1700s. So if you really want to think about it, the IBU scales in the 1700s were somewhere between 30 and 40. The ones be now, the modern ones, are 70 and 80. So this is a bit more reflective of probably what you would have seen in the 1800s, 1700s, even early 1900s. IPAs were big beers in Canada for a long period of time. Um, and it was only up until the mid-1900s that they started to decline because everybody wanted thirst-quenching beers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about carbonation for you. So um, all brewers measure their carbon dioxide levels in their beers, and they usually measure them by volume. And that means that you know, if I had a, a beer that had two volumes of CO2, um, in this particular beer, is how many mils in the can? 473? 473. So 473, double that, and that's the amount of carbon dioxide I'm compressing into that, that can of beer. So Big brewers are around 2.75. These beers are around 2.5, right? Okay. So the benefit is that the more CO2 is a preservative, but the negative part of it is that I'm going to get filled up a lot faster. Because when I di ingest carbon dioxide, one is it's going to rob my body of oxygen, which could give me a headache. That is true. And the other thing is I'm going to get filled up a lot faster. So lower CO2 counts are actually more beneficial for the consumer because you don't get filled up as fast. Because we know that people are going to drink out of the can, um, not necessarily always get it into the glass. So you want to make sure that they're getting the same kind of experience. The other thing is that with lower CO2 count, it's going to be a bit more reflective of what you're going to get on draft beer. And that's why cans are, are a lot easier to transition from a draft experience into a retail experience. Bottles are going to always taste a little bit sharper. Any other questions? Anywhere else you want me to go, Marty? Because I can go a lot of different places. For, for drinkability, then it's probably better to put it in, in a glass? 
Oh, always. Do we want to do that? Um, can you grab me a, a couple of uh, two cans, and we're just going to do it with a couple of different people. Sure. Um, no, just, just the house sale. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Well, beer is always meant to be consumed out of a glass. Always. Yeah. Um, and, and it's to do with a lot of different things. One is you can see it better in there. But you know what? Sometimes in, in our lives, we're not able to have a glass, you know. So if you're camping, you're not having a glass. If you're on the dock, you're not going to get a glass. And um, it, it does. And, and what I want to do is I want to take two people and show them what the difference is on this. So anybody want to volunteer? Dave, you asked the question. <laughs> one? Sorry. Nope. At least you want one, too. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to drink straight out, open it, and then drink straight out of the can. The can is yours, Dave. Yeah, we're not shotgunning. We don't have the vented can. And the vented can is a useless piece of equipment. All it does is... Take a sip. You remember what it tastes like? I want you to remember what it tastes like, and then I want to show you how to pour properly. So you're going to pour, I'm going to, no, you get to pour your own. I'm going to pour Lisa's. <laughs> so you start on a 45, and you pour in, and then you're gradually straightening it out so that you get about a finger to two fingers of foam. So you do want some foam. And then take another sip, and now you're going to tell me which one is smoother. No, you have to play along. For sure, that one. A lot smoother, right? Yeah. So what happens here? It, yeah, it's it's huge, and this is one of the things that you can actually do with consumers, with your friends, with your family. It's just a fun thing to do. Show people that, you know, some people love drinking beer out of bottles, and that's the way that they drink or out of cans. But if you show them how to do this, what happens? inevitably is you show them a better way to consume the beer because this is really the way that Brian intended the beer and Eric intended the beer to be. So what happens here is we create, we create that cover on the beer. So we're now protecting it against oxygen, which is bad. We're releasing the aromas. So the aromas can now come out through the foam because that's what it does. And then I'm releasing some of the CO2, which is creating that smoothness. So now I don't have as much harshness because carbon dioxide can have a bitter mouthfeel and harshness to it. And so really what you want to do is you want to create a smoother drinking experience. Inevitably, you can drink more out of a glass than you can out of a package product. And so again, responsibly, but, um, but, but the right way. So um, When we uh, put the square nail in the can for the first two, three weeks, you know, we've changed the beer. What have you done to the beer? And it's like, are you pouring it into a glass? No. That, that's the reason. That's You're not getting any aroma they coming out of the... Them straight into the growler? Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have had it in the growler before? Yes. Ah. So uh, uh, all right. And then they changed to a can. So, okay, so here's the thing with growlers. Um, unless you have a really, really good growler filler that evacuates all the oxygen out of it, you're getting a double poured beer. And this is one of the reasons that I'm not a fan of um, pitchers in bars. Because what's happening is you pour into the pitcher or the growler and what's happening, you're taking a lot of the CO2 already out and then you're capping it and then you're pouring it again. So you're double pouring it, so you've released it again. So if you're drinking from a growler, it's gonna be flat as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan. Well, yeah. Yeah, flatter, flatter, right, relatively. We attempt to address that by yeah. pre-purging the CO2 right. on our filler right. and then pouring the beer in right away. So we're trying to get the oxygen out of the growler yeah. as much as we can. We do the same thing with a can. It's just a quicker purge. That's yeah, it. yeah. And you know what? I, I think the technology is coming a long way. Like I've seen a lot of, a, a lot of things in my career where, um, you know, there's a liquor store out in Alberta that sells growlers but they sell them out of a draft tap. So, you know, you can imagine walking up to a bar and taking a growler and filling it up, what kind of experience that you're gonna get. And I was in there a little while ago and I was just watching people fill these things up and I thought, 
you have no idea that you're not going to get a great beer when you get home. Like it, and you may be used to it not being a great beer, but then what happens is you, you, get the, you get to the brewer and they start packaging it properly and people go, what's wrong with this? Yeah. It's kind of like Heineken. A lot of people, when they had Heineken on draft, think something's wrong with it because it doesn't taste skunky like it did in the green <laughs> bottle. A Heineken on draft is pure. It's, it's perfect the way it is, right? And it's the thing is that you, you're conditioning the consumer now to think that your beer is, is flawed. Like, it's good in a flawed state. And then when you actually make it perfect, they go, this is not right. <laughs> right? Um, so several of the people here, well, a lot of people deal with public and talk. Yep. So, and, and we're getting a lot of new people coming into the store and then we're, we're at events with a lot of people coming up. Just from your experience with our beers, we're always asked, well, what is this like? Or this is what I drink. What would be closest to that? So from the two that everybody sampled tonight, where would you put them as far as the common names for beers? Wow. No, I, I can. I mean, it, it, but, you know, house ale, it crosses so many boundaries. Um, okay, we can say it's unique then. Well, <laughs> yeah, you, you can, or you can say it's universal if you, if you want. Because um, for me, you know, the fact that it says ale on it shouldn't, say that you can say it's you know a little bit more body than Keith's or X or 50. Um, it's probably more similar to Sleeman Cream Ale than anything else, but Sleeman Cream Ale in a can would be similar. That, that's the, probably the biggest comparison, I would say. But at the same time, I would also compare it to a lot of German Pilsners. Um, you know, whether you go to you know, Hacker Shore, um, it probably is similar to Stella and Heineken from a flavor profile. So that's the thing that I think is really unique about this particular style of beer is that it transcends so many different styles. Um, it's, the, it's a very, very approachable gateway into the world of craft brewing. Um, so that one, you can basically ask people what they drink and figure it out real quick. Like I could transition somebody out of Canadian into that one. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't take me a big stretch to do it. Um, if you want other craft manufacturers or micro manufacturers, you know, there's a handful. Mill Street Stock Ale. Um, you know, there, there may be not a lot in the area. Um, from Square, though, I think that you have to look at what American Pale Ales are, are like. And so Mill Street's Tank House would be the first one. Um, it's definitely got more bitterness than Rickert's Red, but it's got similar color. Um, it's probably got a nicer aroma. Um, Sierra Nevada's Pale Ale is very, very similar to it, and it's a wonderful, it, it really is a wonderful beer. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of American Pale Ales out there that people are trying. It's probably a bit more of a stretch for the traditional beer drinker. So to me, I would get them into house sale first and then sort of gradually move them into square. And I think that's probably what you do anyway. But um, I'm just trying to think of what else. Um, I mean, if you really want um, an analysis of it, I'd have to go and look. And in, in, I have all this information on my computer about where different brands lie. Um, but, you know, it's. It's definitely way more drinkable than any IPA that's out in the market right now. And, you know, to me, it's more true to style on where it should be to begin with. Did you guys enter it yeah. as well? Did I give you the tasting notes back? Yeah. It wasn't well received, though. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It's one, it's, one day, it's one day a year for 20 minutes. Exactly. And, you know, it depends on where it came within. It's weird. Like the... You should come and watch it one day because it's really interesting watching how they do it. I, there's got to be better ways to do it, but within a tasting. Actually, we were standing on the floor thinking that was the one that won. That won. And, so, and then we realized when Brian's off taking the award that, no, they, just, they said it helps it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's sometimes surprising. Some people get very offended when something doesn't win, but the reality is it's, it's judged over 20 minutes, one day a year, and anything can happen. And you know what, it, it's, not, it's not the be all end all, it's more about what they say out there on the street and how it's... 
It is, and it was one of the biggest categories that we had. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of competition. And again, it really depends on where it's put within the, the ladder, right? So if it comes out first, sometimes it's a good thing. If it comes out last, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes if it's back to back with other things. But then some, some judges are looking for certain aspects. To me, um, I, I, do you have BJCP? All right, don't. Um, so BJCP is Beer Judge Certification Program. The, the way that they're taught is to look at flaws. And, and they're, they're taught because they're home brewers traditionally, and what they're trying to do is correct any of the brewing flaws that they might create. So they're, they're always looking for flaws. And the way I teach my programs is to look for the positives and whether or not it's true or to style. I'm eliminating things. For me, if I had 10 beers in front of me, and this is how it would work with me, if they were golden in color, they'd go. They wouldn't even get a second look from me because they're not what that style is demanding. And then I start going through it and seeing where, it, where I want it to be and whether it's well balanced or not. So I, I just have a different way of, of analyzing than a lot of other people. But um, did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, maybe you could get, because most of Canada uh, is still lager drinkers. Yep. Um, most of the world is. Yeah, more for actually. Yeah, 90 10. So maybe, maybe you could just let people on just briefly the difference between an ale and a lager. Okay. That's make, a good point. We, we have made a lager in the past. We haven't been, I would say, successful. Uh, not because Brian has. Done or not done. It's not your fault, it's just right? We haven't got one that, uh, that we've made that I particularly like anyway. So. Okay. Um, all right. First of all, let me get a beer because now I have to talk a little bit. Um, all right. So you already have a full one. I know. I'm like, I didn't share though. That's all right. That's, that's okay. Um, so globally, 90% of all beer that's consumed are lagers and 10% are ales. Um, it's a big number, right? Because you have to think about what almost everybody drinks. It's things like Bud Light. Bud Light's the number two brand in the world. Budweiser's the number three brand in the world. Number one brand in the world is a Chinese beer called Snow, which we've never seen or much less heard of. <laughs> difference between lagers and ales, um, I, I'll give you the science first and then I'll tell you a different way of looking at it. So lagers are, ales are fermented at warmer temperatures for shorter periods of time, and they're aged for shorter periods of time, typically. Lagers are fermented at cold temperatures for longer periods of time and aged probably about twice as long, traditionally, as an ale would be. So they're about two to three times more expensive to produce. Colder temperatures mean that you're subduing flavors and aromas. So there are less flavors and aromas that are typically produced in a lager than in an ale. However, the aromas that come from yeast fermenting at colder temperatures are two really big negatives. So it's sulfur and something called diacetyl, which is butter. It smells like movie popcorn butter. The way you get rid of them is by aging them. So you have to go to like 21 days aging. So you can imagine now you got 10 days of fermentation and 21 days of aging. I got a full month of production. So lagers are way more expensive and they're a lot more delicate. And so the, the thing with it that you have to take into consideration is that you, it requires a tremendous amount of skill to do a lager properly. And a lot of people that are making lagers probably shouldn't be making them to begin with because they can't do what they do well. Um, ales are more creative. The lagers are, are a very, very narrow scope. Like there's not, if I showed you the lager family tree, it's like this. The ale family tree is this big. And it's just because there's more creativity, there's more that you can do with the yeast strains in there. Um, so what we found, is, and lager is a German word meaning to store. And so lagering techniques were discovered in the 1400s because brewers found that sulfur and diacetyls were coming out of their beers. So they said, oh, we'll just stick them over in the cellars in the, in the mountains for a while and we'll see what happens to it. So what happens is those volatile components dissipate the beer becomes a lot smoother, easier to drink, and all of a sudden lagers start becoming a little bit more popular, but didn't become popular until pilsners were created, which is a style of a lager. So how does that all fit in? Because you don't have any time to tell a consumer all that nonsense, right? Because it's science and people, they shut down when you start telling them science, right? Yeah, so here's the way you do it. You compare it to wine. Ales are like red wines, lagers are like white wines. 
Ales are more, they're fuller in flavor, they're more robust, they have more aromatics, they are served best at warmer temperatures, and they go better with fuller tasting foods. Lagers, on the other hand, are like white wines. They're served best at colder temperatures in tall, narrow glasses with lighter tasting foods. They're more refreshing, easier to drink. Surprisingly, ale is three letters, and red is three letters, and lager is five letters, and white is five letters. It is. It just doesn't work in French. It doesn't work in French. <laughs> Sometimes you come upon these things. You go, what? <laughs> Uh, sometimes, um, they, they have learned how to speed processes up, um, and that's not necessarily the best thing, but it's still true the longer you age, the smoother your beer is. So a beer that is aged seven days has edges to it, whereas a beer that's aged 21 days is nice and well balanced. Um, and they produce so many lagers because that's what consumers want. So you make beers, sure. Well, you know, it all happened in, in when Pilsners were created in the 1840s. So they, Pilsen, this is little town in, in the Czech Republic, which was Bohemia at that time, didn't like the way that they were making beer. So they hired a German brewmaster to come in. And the Bavarian brewmaster brought with him light colored malt, so the pale malt, refrigeration, filtration. Created first golden clear beer in the world. People start drinking it and realizing, I can drink lots of this. <laughs> Right? And we're dealing with the late 1800s, early 1900s with large rural communities and industrialization. So you're working really hard. You're working 60, 70 hours a week. You don't want one beer. You want several. And so consumer demands have changed in that time frame to a point where we view beer as a thirst quencher. And so most of the big brewers make beers that satisfy the needs of, of those consumers. That's, yeah, this is not going to go too public. Although, if I get a copy of it, it may go on my <laughs> site. Um, yeah, glacier water really, no, doesn't work. Although, there is a brewery in Newfoundland called Kitty Vitty that uses waters from glaciers out in the ocean. Oh, they send a helicopter out, and the helicopter goes and gets water, and it brings it back. And it's in this beautiful blue bottle. Like it's. <laughs> to go find a glacier. Yeah. Yeah, it would be good, just for fun. <laughs> Drop it in. Um, yeah, usually the glacier waters are all filtered. So you're not getting any of that pristine characteristic that you're getting out of a well. You know, the other thing of using, and uh, I'm a big fan of using local water, trust me, because I'm always wondering where the well water is coming from. Like, is it, how close is it to the surface? Am I picking up any bacteria? It's great to say that you're using spring water, but what the hell's in it? Right? Whereas city water, like the city's done a pretty good job of figuring out, they just put chlorine in it. And you just got to get rid of that. So, other questions? You got tons, Marty. Keep taking me down a place where I haven't, I didn't go to. Other questions or do you want to eat some pizza? Okay. Like we make a dark ale, our Henry's Irish ale. Okay. So it's our fall beer, our October, October, November, starting to get rain, cool type beer. Okay. And then we make a stout. Brown ale. Brown ale. Yeah. And then we make a stout in the wintertime. Okay. So it's more robust uh, by the fire type beer. Okay. Brown ales, dark ale, um, were really popular during Queen Victoria's time. She was a big fan of them, and um, which is good to know, right? The Queen likes beer. And um, so they were really, really popular at that time. What happened with, uh, with brown ales, they sort of turned into porters because um, in London, a lot of the guys that were doing a lot of the heavy work were called porters, and they were a very thirsty crowd. So a lot of the publicans, interestingly enough, <laughs> uh, started blending beer in the pub. So they took three different beers, and they blended them together and put them into a glass for these, these guys. And they were dark, really dark, very robust, very strong ales. And then it was a little while later that one particular man, Ralph uh, Harwood, in, in this little town called Shoreditch, 
decided that he was actually going to brew that. So he brewed a porter. He brewed something called a porter, specifically designed for the working class people that was a little bit more robust, a little bit more flavor, lots of nutrition in it. And so that's where porters came from. And then they made the porters stronger, more alcohol, more flavor, and called them robust or stout porters. And then the word porter got dropped and stout became a style of its own. And uh, the other, the good thing from a health perspective, because I talk a lot about health benefits when I'm talking about beer, is that the darker the beer, the healthier it is. There's a lot of antioxidants in dark beers, and they're all coming from the melanonin and the malts and the hops that are being used. So the darker the beer, the better it is. You often hear people say that uh, Guinness is a really healthy beer, right? So there's a lot of myths about Guinness. So one is there's no iron in Guinness. There's, you don't want iron in your beer. Iron's a bad thing, right, brewers? Bad iron. Um, but what it has is a ton of antioxidants in it. It's got lots of mineral content and, uh, well, sort of. Not really. That's one of those myths. It's not a myth, but it's not as bad as what people would want it to believe. So what you're referring to is something called Finings or Isinglass. And Finings and Isinglass are the swim bladders of tropical fish. And several hundred years ago, somebody realized that if you dried these things out and threw them into cask beer, that they acted as a clarifier. So what it did was it pulled all the, co it pulled all the particulate out to the bottom. So it didn't really add any flavor, it just pulled everything out. So if you're brewing in a very traditional style, you'll still use Isinglass and Finings in the brewing of your beer. And if you're making cask beer, then you're definitely doing it because you want to pull the particulate down. So Guinness still uses Isinglass in the brewing of their beers, so they, they come under some criticism. Vegans don't drink it, so. If had any comments about that. Uh, other styles that you want me to? Is that good? Have you seen, <coughs> you've been in the beer business a long time. Have yeah. you seen a growth in the darker ales? Typically they were. Oh, yeah. Like, Darker weather, cooler weather, that type of thing. Yeah. Are you seeing it, that darker ale transcend? Yeah, I'm starting to see um, a, a change in people's openness to try darker beers. I think consumers typically drink with their eyes. So they see something that's dark and they think it's going to be heavy and it's going to fill them up. And um, that, that's a, it's sometimes is an okay assumption, but for the most part, I don't find that with beer because with the bitterness and the carbonation, you usually get a, a relatively quick finish. And especially with a dark ale, a dark ale is not, it's got lots of flavor, but it's not a long finish. You get more finish on porters and stouts, and stouts even more so than porters. Um, but I, I think people are more open now, and they're starting to understand that they compare them better with foods. Dark ales go, dark beers go great with food. Um, but the other thing is I think people still drink by seasonality. You know, like you get into summer, you start thinking dark beers are for the fire. They're for, the, you know, a, a, a warm fall night or a, a cool fall night where you want to warm up. They find them more warming. Um, and a lot of that is just mental. Like I, you know, a really nice cold dark ale in the heat of the summer is just as thirst quenching as a lager would be or as a Kolsch would be. You just have to change your temperature but you're gonna get more flavor out of it the more you warm it up. But I, I, I think I'm starting to see a little bit more. Again, you know, um, there was hardly any wheat beers in the marketplace when I started, and now it's a real fast-growing category, and a lot of people are all introducing wheat beers into it. We're seeing more porters, more stouts now. Um, I think IPAs have pretty much hit their stride. Like they're, we're not gonna see a whole lot more there. There's, it's sort of like reinventing the wheel. Like every time a new IPA comes out and somebody sticks it in front of me, I go, okay, really? It's gonna, let me guess, it's gonna smell like grapefruit and it's, gonna, and, and it's gonna be really bitter. And then that doesn't make me, it doesn't make me jump up and down. However, if you give me a porter or a dark ale or a stout and you know, two minutes after I've had my first sip, I'm starting to taste chocolate and tiramisu and other kinds of things, I start going, okay. This brewer actually took some time and thought about what they were going to make and how that was going to impact me as opposed to just kicking my taste buds down my throat. So I think IPAs are, they're overrated at best. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I like to hear. 